Um, as is often the case, people are tripping in for the dinner this evening and the festivities this evening, so don't be surprised. We'll have some folks kind of filter in as, uh, as time goes on here. We have plenty of time for a very, what I think is going to be a really interesting conversation. Um, so what we've got set up for you here today is we have two panels behind me. And we'll ask these guys to introduce themselves in a minute. But basically, we've got a young professionals panel and a seasoned professionals <laughs> panel. And I love how the, the, I just commented, rose between two thorns. Do you guys see that? Isn't that, isn't that something? Um, but, uh, but the idea here is we, we were talking in one of our board meetings about this notion of intrapreneurship. How many people have heard about intrapreneurship? It's a, it's a thing. I didn't either. And then I, of course, Googled it as soon as uh, we got done talking about it. And there's a real study out there about entrepreneurship. And as you might imagine, it's about creating an environment wherein you have, um, you have the ability to innovate, to create. You can take risk. You can fail and respond. But really, to create inside an organization what is often associated with entrepreneurial spirit, right? With an entrepreneur uh, in an organization, in a smaller organization, create something that's agile. So that's the concept, is that within the organization, how do you create an environment of intrapreneurship? And we would like to think, here at the Bellwether League, we would like to think that what we're also doing is creating a forum for future bellwethers to grow and flourish within an environment to continue to, uh, to express themselves, to innovate and create. So, so we've set up this panel. We have a series of questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to record this. I don't know. Did I mention that to you guys? Uh, it just slipped my mind. But, but yeah, we are going to record this so that we can play you guys back, right? Because what we're going to do is on our podcast, there'll be some just really juicy snidbits that you guys will come up with that we're going to want to make sure we put back out there. So, so you'll get to hear some of this later on on our podcast as well. But, um, but again, there'll be a few trickle in as we go. Won't let that stop us. What I want to do right now is just get us started with, uh, uh, with brief introductions around uh, the tables here. So, Will, if you wouldn't mind getting us started, just kind of your name, which the rest of your name, I gave him the first part. Um, <laughs> and then your organization, and maybe just a little something about what inspired you to maybe want to attend this particular panel. Absolutely. Thank you, Ed. Uh, it's an honor to be here. My name is Will Gonzalez. Uh, full name is Wilberto, so that's why I go by Will. Um, born and raised in Miami, Florida. Um, started my supply chain career in 2009 with uh, Baptist Health South Florida uh, in the corporate contracting and sourcing uh, realm and uh, moved to Chicago in uh, 2013 and uh, found my, found my, uh, my role with uh, Loyola University Medical Center as a procurement project manager and uh, have been supporting Loyola in their mission uh, alongside McNeil, Gottlieb, and uh, Mercy Chicago inside of uh, Trinity Health uh, uh, supply chain. So uh, what, are, what, are, what drew me to this opportunity uh, is my, my curiosity to continue to my growth and can continue to learn uh, within supply chain, uh, learning from the best, and I think you know this organization is 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 in that realm, and uh, look forward to the opportunity to have have a conversation. Absolutely, you'll be surrounded by some of the very best. So thanks, Will. June. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is June Amora. I am VP of Supply Chain at Geisinger. Such a privilege to be here amongst some of the best thinkers and leaders in. Healthcare supply chain, as you know, we're going to talk about today, we're relied on to bring a lot of value to the industry that we belong to. So it's nice to be amongst many peers. Uh, just like Will, I started my career around 2009, 2010 in Seattle Children's Hospital um, in supply chain. Um, since then, I've kind of hopped around the country <laughs> um, from Seattle to Cleveland uh, to New York City, now at Geisinger. Um, each time been given tremendous opportunity to contribute, to innovate, like you're talking about, to take risks and to take uh, big projects and be able to lead them. So it's such a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thanks, June. Amy. My name is Amy Chapa. 
Um, I actually started uh, my career outside of healthcare in international shipping and then worked for a software company before coming into healthcare supply chain. Um, I enjoy solving puzzles and I enjoy a lot of the challenges that the industry has. Um, and with uh, some of the changes over the last 10, 15 years with technology, with the ERP, EMR systems, um, and some of the growth, um, it's been really exciting. Um, I am just finishing up taking a year off, a year sabbatical, kind of a pseudo retirement. I wish I could stay. <laughs> um, but prior to that, I was with Piedmont Healthcare uh, with them through a, a tremendous growth over about 12 years from three to 11 facilities, uh, EMR changes, and et cetera. Um, and, and we'll be joining a health system in Florida um, here shortly. Um, the reason why I'm here is, is uh, similar to the folks on my left. It's, it's an honor to be here. Um, I think everyone is looking forward to um, some new changes and opportunities um, uh, that are starting to get some traction in the industry. Um, and, and so to be a part of that and uh, people wanting to hear kind of different perspectives and opinions, it's, it's great to be one of those voices. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Okay, over here. You know, and it's, it's striking. All the preparation, the notes, some of them purely electronic. No paper at all in front of June there. And, uh, and Mary's got a name badge and a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> Carl, is that a napkin? Yeah. Nick, you got a couple of notes there. Yeah, I do. Good. Introduce yourself. Good afternoon. I'm Nick Toscano. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Julicon Advisors. We are a uh, strategic advisory for primarily large health systems around the country, and I am excited to be here, see some old friends, and make some new friends as well, and uh, look forward to today. Thank you. Mary? Hi, everybody. I'm Mary Starr. I'm with the Green Health Exchange. I'm the Vice President of Member Care, which means I'm the member-facing person on our team. I have about 30 years' experience um, both on the acute and non-acute care side, GPO and consulting. And I'm here because I think I'm old on the outside, but young on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> and together, you know, with young, fresh ideas and experience, we can be that much stronger um, in the industry. Perfect. Carl? I'm Carl Meyer, Executive Vice President of the Wetridge Group. Uh, I started my career with Xerox and spent 12 and a half years with the old General Medical slash McKesson. Went into the e-commerce world with Neoforma for four years, which was very entertaining. Then spent eight and a half years with a medical device company, BSN Medical, and I've been consulting ever since. Um, like the rest of the people here, I want to learn from each other, and I'm here because you asked me. <laughs> very good. And there was a quid pro quo involved. I'm on a panel for Carl in a couple of weeks too, right? So, um, so my name is Ed Hiscock. I realized I asked these guys to introduce, didn't even tell you who I was, right? So Ed Hiscock, SVP at Trinity Health. I run supply chain for that organization. I'm also uh, a proud member of the board of the Bellwether League. And I'd like to introduce one of my compatriots on the board here, uh, Nate. And Nate's going to start off with a series of questions for our young professionals. And then we're going to spend a minute, and I'd ask you guys to be thinking through kind of some questions, some probing you might want to do as you hear their responses to the questions about, again, establishing that bellwether environment, that entrepreneur environment in an organization, be you on the supplier, GPO, consulting, or provider side. Um, but just think about some questions. We'll have some time in the middle. Again, one of the things that, uh, uh, that our seasoned panels asked was, you know, that the synapses don't fire as rapidly. So they ask that the young professionals go first and that they get a few minutes to kind of caucus and think about it and you know, chisel some things on a stone tablet or two um, uh, before they respond. But basically, they're going to take and respond to what they heard and, and help us understand how that may or may not work with their organizations or organizations they've served previously. So Nate, if you don't mind introducing yourself and getting us started, thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Nate Mickish, I'm the Vice President of Strategic Sourcing with Texas Health Resources. Uh, as Ed mentioned, I'm also a member of the Bellwether Board and a future famer class of 2015. That's before they figured out that I didn't belong there, so <laughs> excited about that. Famers, congratulations. Thanks for coming back, Amy. It's good to have some repeat offenders here at this uh, annual meeting. Um, I don't know what we'd call you guys, but uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I'll stick to my questions. I've, I'm, sta I'm standing behind the, pat uh, the uh, podium because this is where I keep my notes, and I am uh, fully electronic as well. So uh, my, my first question to the Future Famer uh, panelists, um, obviously there's a fight for talent, young talent uh, moving into leadership roles across the healthcare supply chain. It's a pretty esoteric discipline or a critical discipline. Um, so from my perspective, folks like yourselves kind of have the, have the pick when you're out of the marketplace and, and looking for employers. So with that in mind, what do you look for in an employer or a leader uh, when it comes to technology, pace, culture, et cetera? What, what are you looking for? And I'll start with you, Amy. He's picking on me because I've been doing this for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think it's an interesting time um, with the, the overall pace of the industry in terms of external factors um, that organizations have to react to. And then Ed talked about entrepreneurship. Um, you know, when you're trying to make changes within your own world, whether that's your department or support services or however you want to deem that, it takes a good amount of energy and um, uh, bandwidth as well. And so finding that balance between those two not just with the leader and the organization in terms of supporting your energy and efforts. Um, I think it's also important to understand where the organization as a whole is. Um, so to give you an example, when it comes to um, you know, the recruitment part and retaining um, talent, there is a heavy reliance and partnership with human resources, right? And being able to afford technology advancements or, or integration of technology, there's a lot of reliance with IT. And so really understanding the capabilities of other organizations uh, or I guess subsystems within an organization that you have to depend on in order to achieve those things to figure out what kind of paths you will have to success, um, what type of tools and resources you have av available to try to figure out what you can um, attract to the organization and keep and for how long, right? That's probably one of the bigger challenges as well in terms of trying to have some sustaining methodology and standing up new processes and, and getting through some significant change management. Um, so for from my perspective, looking at kind of that whole picture, the whole success, not just me as an individual or just as supply chain within the organization or whatever the immediate goal is, whether it's a short term or long term, but really looking at how all of it's going to work and if things change on a dime, what does that landscape look like and what are your resources in order to survive through that? I got a follow-up question real quick for you. Not I don't enough. know. This is off script. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so with that in mind, I mean, you're, you're going to be starting a new position. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming going into the interview process and things like that, you probably had a checklist or ways to kind of ferret out what that what you were going into like from the employer. So do you have any suggestions or ways to kind of evaluate as you're interviewing? Yeah. Um, um, so I took a little bit different approach um, to my uh, looking for my next opportunity. Um, I actually forewent kind of the checklist of things, the, the mechanical parts, the what I'm going to be doing, what the job is, and really focused a lot more on kind of, I guess, the softer side. Um, looking for fit and feel, um, kind of that dynamic when you're sitting in the room with somebody, you know, um, it's very, in fact, uh, one organization, it was a lot of phone and Skype interviewing, um, and you're just, aren't, you're just not gonna get the same um, feel through that right, no matter how well your questions are answered or how many different people you talk to. Um, so my focus is really more on fit um, and uh, around how the organization was determining what they wanted to do short term and long term as opposed to the specific objectives and goals um, because as we all know that can change. Um, and so I took a little bit of a different approach, it's a bit more on the, the people piece and how you can move, maneuver through kind of drawing on what I said earlier. Good. Good. June, how about you? Sure. So I took this question slightly differently. So I think about how do you attract the best talent so they could be your entrepreneurs? And you know what comes to mind for me is really a generational question. In the generation of employees you're trying to attract, how do you attract that generation to begin with? Younger, smart people coming out of college to healthcare supply chain. And then the next question is, how do you attract the best out of the best of that generation? So um, I did a bit of research. <laughs> so um, you know, according to the Pew Research Center, in 2017, millennials became the largest component of the American workforce. About 37% of the American workforce are now millennials. 
But also, according to Forbes, 44% um, of college graduated millennials are stuck in low wage, dead end jobs, the highest rate in decades. Only 29% of millennials felt engaged in their jobs, therefore, 70% did not. And most of these people who are engaged are in Silicon Valley jobs, um, not in healthcare. 60% of millennials will leave their jobs within the first three years, costing their employees an average of $20,000 per person. So the next generation, or the millennial generation, are in general poorer than the previous generation. Um, they are more educated, yet poorer. They tend to marry later in life, buy property later in life, and they're also less religious. So it's a very kind of interesting confluence of very different attributes of this particular generation that I happen to belong to. Um, we are asked to value loyalty, work ethic, climbing the corporate ladder, and in return we are rewarded with steady lifelong employment. These were the values that were valued by the generation before us. But are they the values that we value as a, as a, as a generation? But as it turns out, it's not. The millennial generation is marked by a value of independence, learning, discovery, contribution, and broad latitude for cross-learning and divergent career paths. All the things you're looking for in an entrepreneur, right? Um, Work-life balance and meaningful life has suddenly taken first, top, and second spot in things that we value most over kind of a steady, loyal, lifelong employment. According to a 2015 study by Ernst & Young, millennials marry later in life started families later, about three to seven years later than the previous generation, um, and they want flexibility of, uh, of work-life balance, and it's the number one thing they hear all the time for interviewing candidates. Um, and yet, companies still see it as a, an, an exception when you ask for something different uh, and not the norm. So I think these are the things that we need to focus on if we want to attract some of the best talent, um, and especially the best of that particular generation. So what are we looking for? The first one, I think, is clarity of contribution. You know, our generation, it's the generation of things that are um, socially responsible. Um, companies such as Warby Parker, where you buy a pair of glasses and they distribute and contribute another pair of glasses to a someone in need. Uh, companies such as um, Airbnb that collect some of the funds and give it to people who need that funds. Um, Tom's shoes, who when you buy a pair of shoes, they give away another pair of shoes. Socially responsible companies tend to be attractive to our to millennial generation because we value how we contribute. Uh, we are attracted to a mission. So the mission of the value creation must be clear. For healthcare, this is often a straight path. You know, our value, our mission is to take care of people, and that's great. But the pathways by which we create this value these pathways are often inefficient, unclear, and plagued with deeply entrenched politics. And that's not the game that we necessarily want to play. We want to be challenged with big problems, solve them, give us latitude and independence to work on those problems, and then go after them. So we want to feel valued in the way we create value as well. So we want to be given worth, big worthy projects to solve, sufficient guardrails, guidance, equitable, equitable incentive to solve such problems. We want to solve problems using tools like design thinking, lean process improvement, engineering, and not primarily just through managing internal politics. Um, so that's how I'd answer your question. So as a follow-up question, <laughs> um, those are great answers. Um, as a leader, and you know, as a leader that's in this generation as an attracting talent, um, obviously, you know, some of the legacy cultures that we deal with coming up and where we're at in, this or in, you know, in the organization in our life cycle of our careers, what do you do as a leader to, to foster more of that type of environment, uh, even if you are in an in a, in a industry that is heav heav heavily driven by political uh, considerations when it comes to decision making? I think you need to know your lane and your space that you can kind of create. So at Geisinger, we have a real vision, kind of our strategic priorities. Uh, you know, my boss and I are quickly translating that into what that means for supply chain. And within that space, we try to create projects that allow us to be entrepreneurial. Um, understanding that we'll need support from many of the different support services, departments, service lines within Geisinger. Uh, but in effect, you kind of create an internal company within kind of a bigger company. Um, and in that company, you can foster the values uh, that we look for in entrepreneurs. Great. Very good. All right, Will. How about I'll you? I have to follow June. Oh, boy. Yeah, I mean. 
<laughs> he came with the stats. Yeah, he came with the stats, right? <laughs> um, I, I think from a different perspective, um, I look at it from myself, uh, and, and not calling myself a millennial, because I'm, well, not a millennial, uh, but I, <laughs> I, I would say, you know, that a little bit of what he's saying, uh, meaning in the work that you do, right? Finding that meaning, finding individuals that appreciate uh, what healthcare brings to our community, to our patients, uh, that value. I'll give you an example uh, where I found meaning was in, early on in my career at Baptist Health. Uh, I, I wound up doing work uh, with a company where I negotiated a contract uh, for partial and total knees and come to find out my dad you know, needed a knee, knee replacement. He, took he was able to take advantage of the, you know, what we were able to do by bringing this company in and had a very successful transition. Uh, so it touched me personally, the work that I was doing. That's, that's where I find the meaning uh, in the everyday. I, I don't touch patients, but in a way, you know, I find that supply chain, supply chain does every day. Uh, creativity, you know, being afforded uh, the ability to be creative in the work that we do. Um, just an example I would say is uh, when I was able to fly down to Miami, one of the times that I was uh, down there, and found that there was a, a technology convention, eMERGE. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, uh, but it's a, it's a tech, big technology convention that brings all the high-tech uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups, and went there not because I was told to by my company, but I went there with the idea of, let me see what, what technology is bringing in, in the idea of, of healthcare. Uh, was able to find some interesting you know, uh, ideas uh, which we could maybe talk about a little bit later, uh, block, you know, um, blockchain and, and uh, you know, um, AI, 3D printing, things like that, with, along with so many other things that they were, that they were in the forefront of, of talking about. Uh, but being afforded that ability to go there and then bring my ideas back to the organization, see what we can do, what we can, uh, you know, uh, transition. And then autonomy, uh, for me, uh, as a leader, I, I, I look forward to having that ability to, to move around within the organization and, ha and grow my relationships with different leaders, whether it be in engineering or IT, uh, human resources, or even our, our chief nursing officer. Uh, not just because of the limitations of my role, but just being afforded to go you know, to those areas and, and have those conversations and find out where the need is and, and be the support that, that the organization needs. So. Yeah, along those lines, um, and this is really for any, anybody who wants to answer, um, I've always kind of thought that you can learn as much about operations and healthcare as, as anybody from the supply chain vantage point, especially if you're looking at it with a pretty wide lens, not just focused on saving money on reference books and pencils and things like that. So um, what, if anything, uh, one, do any of you have aspirations to ever pivot into operations from the role that you're currently in? Um, if so, why? If, if not, that's fine too. Um, also, have you also noticed a difficulty in people moving out of supply chain into different uh, roles, into, into different disciplines within healthcare, um, or not? That wasn't a great question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say, I mean, uh, I could say personally, um, uh, operations is, is, a, is a very valuable you know, uh, place to be. And um, in my career, I think that's my next step, uh, is, is, to, is to explore that, that avenue of, I mean, I come, again, I come in a, with a background in contracting and procurement and sourcing uh, in, in different levels of supply chain, maybe not so much so in, in operations, right? So how do I get to that point? I position myself by making myself open to new opportunities, such as being here, uh, with, with, uh, with the folks here, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I, I think that that's, uh, it has to happen. Yeah, I think that that's something where we have to be well-rounded in all the areas of supply chain, right? Uh, and so we can strengthen our position, maybe be in the C-suite someday in the, in the near future, right? For those organizations that don't have a, uh, a chief supply chain officer in, in, uh, in their organizations. I mean, that I think is where the, the future lies you know, positioning ourselves to be more of a value with all the value that we bring into an organization. Sure, yeah, I guess, Nate, I view myself as already in operations. Um, you know, I manage a very critical operation in a hospital. Um, 
you know, not just in the logistics and distribution and giving our caregivers the supplies they need to take care of the patients, but in front end processes like contracting and RFPs, sourcing, negotiations, contract management. And I only see the role of supply chain as an ever growing operation as we lean on it for cost containment um, and potentially even some revenue generation. So um, I already see myself in operations. That's great. <laughs> no, I, so I, I agree um, a good bit with June. I think depending on the areas of supply chain that you've had exposure to or, or you're, that you're in, uh, it's definitely a part of operations. Um, I do think that um, the way supply chain is engaged with other areas, whether it's the clinical areas, the other support areas, um, suppliers, GPOs, et cetera, um, the way to engage is probably where um, I think the key lies in terms of how that's going to change. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I've been fortunate to see um, some individuals make it, I'll say, out of supply chain, but move into other areas, whether um, uh, so I've seen them move over into revenue cycle and, and work with some contract mm -hmm. management type stuff, same as IT. Um, seen some folks that were kind of supply chain, IT, MMIS move into um, IT roles mm -hmm. kind of then supporting and, and uh, being that voice of how things integrate and being able to make it um, improve at a faster pace because they came from the business and understand it. And I've, I've seen some go to um, other industries. I think it's less about the what they know from a, do like a domain expertise of supply chain and it's more mm -hmm. about the skills and how they can leverage it in other, or in other uh, departments or, or subsystems. And I think that gets to some of the earlier comments we had in terms of what are people looking for and um, how do you get that um, with the skills that you have, whether it's negotiation, attention to detail, supply chain is very much a get things from point A to point B, has to be able to be proactive as well as reactive. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the how you make yourself present mm -hmm. in some of those that, that'll be key. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for playing along with us on that one. So. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. What's, what's the future of healthcare supply chain look like, say, 15 years from now? And I'll start in reverse order this time with Will. So. Sure. Um, I think it's a super complex question. I, I mean, uh, and I'll go back to what uh, some of the things that I learned at that, uh, that technology conference. I, technology changes at such a rapid pace. I think the, anything that you can think of that, that we should be going towards in one year to the next could potentially change within you know, uh, months. Um, I, I, I have to say that uh, part of uh, universities play a key role uh, in how we're teaching uh, uh, our candidates. Um, I think the environment has changed so much so that you know, you're not really teaching a curriculum uh, of, uh, of learning, uh, you know, supply chain, but how do we teach them to, to be a, a, a forever learner, right? How do you teach somebody to be a, a change agent, a change manager, um, and roll with the evolution of, of the industry, whether it's self-care or whatever. I think uh, whatever industry you happen to fall in, in, in universities, you have to kind of, I think, change the way that you're, you're doing that. And, I, and I, I, hear, I did hear a lot of that talk when I was uh, when I was part of that, and I, th I completely agree with that. Um, I think there's there's p tremendous potential um, in, in future technologies such as uh, you know uh, autonomy, uh, autonomous vehicles, autonomous warehouses, uh, robotics, uh, all these things that are coming down that I think will change the, the future of, of supply chain uh, and how you know people that are, have your just traditional roles in supply chain may change, where you have managers in a warehouse or, or a, that you know maybe you don't need a coordinator of, of a warehouse. You need to have somebody who's more of an engineer, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who can work between human beings and robots. And so, how do we, you know, how does that, how does that look? And so, uh, there's a lot of change in managing, you know, uh, those changes with the existing fleet of folks that you have. Yeah. Not scaring them away, but saying, "Look, this is this is where we need to go, right?" And yeah. giving them the tools to to be a forever learner. Where you know, in eight months from now, you're going to be learning new skills, and, and an organization that's going to be open to that. 
right? So that's that's an interesting take too on the on the developments or the the talent side of it, development and what kind of roles would will exist, you know, uh, fifteen years from now, or will it be sort of a variation of the same theme? Yeah. Um, so that's interesting, Jim. What do you what do you think of that? Um, so I think that supply chain will, um, like I said earlier, I think it'll continue to grow in its influence over the organization. It's going to be relied upon um, for, for delivering four main things, um, I think. So I think two of which um, supply chain is already being relied on to do. And I think two of the additional ones, in my opinion, will be in addition to what we currently do. So I think future of supply chain will be seen as a critical service line, um, really a strategic um, asset to the organization um, for four things, cost containment, quality improvement. I think those are the two things that are table stakes today. Um, but I think in the future, uh, and maybe for some, you're already here, revenue generation, um, and fourth is innovation. As it stands today, we're clear about the role of supply chain in cost containment, right? We have savings targets, um, and we ought to lower inventory levels and be more efficient, apply automation to what we do. So that's kind of table stakes around cost containment. Um, but the second is quality improvement. Um, if you notice, I didn't use value analysis or formulary management. I think those two things are components of what we're trying to do. The outcome is quality improvement. Clinically integrated supply chains now have created inroads to clinical um, decision making uh, with uh, you know, quality departments, physician leaders, helping to standardize products that support clinical pathways. In Geisinger, we call that proven care. What's the best way to take care of a patient in the most cost-effective way? Um, and how does supply chain, how do the supplies, the equipment, the devices, even the services that we use apply against that clinical pathway? So I think supply chain will continue to be part of that conversation um, and be relied on as a partner in clinical decision making. So I think the second, that's the second one. The third one, revenue generation. So, so naturally, larger supply chains today, um, more sophisticated supply chains today, um, have begun harnessing their um, strengths, logistics, distribution. If you have a service center or a distribution warehouse, you may have started selling some of your distribution services to nearby hospitals that may not be part of your IDN. I think that's part of what you know, supply chains will continue doing. Um, supply chains that have strong formularies and strong contracts have begun opening those formularies and contracts to smaller entities um, through you know, regionalized GPOs or um, even the program that Cleveland Clinic has around Accelerate. So being able to buy in to say, these are the products used by this very prominent organization, um, you know, I'm gonna be willing to pay a small fee to, to use that same formulary of products. I think the last one is innovation. Uh, supply chains have started contracting differently. We've started forming you know, risk share uh, type of arrangements, creating deeper relationships with our vendors in an unprecedented way. Um, I think traditional transactional relationships will always be a flavor in our conversation, but deeper, meaningful, more relationships will be important. I think su supply chains will also adopt the use of machine learning, especially for repeated processes like purchasing. Um, so it's ripe for innovation like robotic process automation. Um, I think it will also start to use a artificial intelligence to solve problems that have always plagued our departments. like. You know, we have incorrect preference cards, which I know everyone in this room has. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, supply chains will start to adopt, um, like you said, autonom autonomous automated um, solutions to solve these age old problems. I like that emphasis on, on innovation. Uh, a few years ago, it struck me that, you know, we're not really in the business of identifying solutions right now in the reactive state when it's, everything's about cost containment. And you see yourselves at times, especially when new products come to market, that you're looking at just purely from a cost perspective. But there's an element of me and my role and my, my team's role where I'd much rather be ahead of all the national conventions in introducing new technologies to our, our clinicians and physicians rather than, you know, constantly waiting for that to be brought to us by, by those folks. And so um, that's interesting. A, a little bit of a take, uh, I'm, so I'm gonna pull the rug out from under you a little bit on this one, Amy, but um, so a little bit of a flip of that, you know, when we're talking about uh, bringing new automation to repeated tasks and things like that, um, and, I, and I do think a, a big part of even like a sourcing strategy uh, could be automated uh, significantly. Um, how do you convince a workforce that's growing up in that, that 
that doesn't necessarily just immediately mean job elimination. It means further opportunity to create higher value work uh, for themselves and also for the organization. And if you don't want to answer that one, we can just go back to the other one. So. No, I think I like that one better. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think um, I look at introduction of technology maybe a little bit different than some. Uh, a lot of folks look at technology in terms of what it's going to do uh, in terms of making things quicker, faster, smarter, uh, et cetera. I guess I look at it a little bit differently. I see technology as um, kind of more in the human resources um, side of things. Uh, you can't do anything with technology. Put it in, take it out, upgrade it, uh, decommission it, whatever it is, without people. And so I think to answer more specifically, to answer your question, how do you get people to stop thinking that it's an automatic elimination of positions? Um, number one, we have to prove that we can do that. We have to prove that it is, they're not really looking for the, an elimination of job reduction. They want to know that their specific, they themselves are going to have a role. Mm -hmm. And um, similar to what you, you said, Will, about the universities needing to kind of uh, make sure they create you know, life learners and things like that. We need to figure out how to get our leaders or the people that support our teams um, to get the workforce ready to be able to absorb that training and be ready to do something different than what they went to school for. Um, embrace change, which we know is very difficult, but embrace that, oh, you used to be this position and this is how you did things with whatever, say the item file, and tomorrow it's gonna be something different and here are the skills. I think part of the challenge in that is it's, it's not just are the people willing and do you have the people that can help them get there. Healthcare moves so fast we don't always have the time, right? And you can probably pull in a lot of quotes from, was it Lee Iacocca that said, right, a lot of good people but just didn't have the time to let them get there. That's going to be problematic. And so if you're standing in front of a workforce saying we're going to put in this technology but don't worry, we're going to train you so you can learn all these new skills that, you know, to do things that you that didn't even exist when you went to school, how are you going to make good on that if you don't have the people to train them or you don't have the time to allow them to get where they need to be? Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think that's, a big, uh, that's a big challenge. Uh, I, I don't know for sure, but it seems like a lot of, you know, you can't um, flip through the Wall Street Journal for more than a couple weeks without seeing a, a failed ERP implementation that cost the company millions and millions of dollars. And you always wonder, uh, how much of that was just not thinking that thinking it out on the people side ahead of implementing the technology to your point And it's almost almost like everybody needs to have a little bit more patience when they're implementing a technology to have that t that transition take a little bit of time It's like a mini cultural change really right it is and, and I think you know as you have um, Some really bright people creating some technologies that do things that we haven't figured out how to train or, or get um, people to do and we haven't figured out how to sustain training programs or we haven't been able to um, keep processes intact whenever a leader changes or whenever the person that's been there for 25 years leaves or uh, your key counterpart in AP or wherever um, is, is still there. It, it's, it's, a real, it's a real challenge because if those really bright people create this thing that does some things that we couldn't get other people to do or you didn't understand how it happened, we just liked the result, how are you possibly going to maintain it or make it better? Did you ever listen to that Freakonomics podcast where they said that uh, it took, uh, I don't know, was it 30 or 40 years after uh, electricity for the, for the efficiency gains to be put in place in manufacturing because they still had their equipment oriented around steam power? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, we see analogs of that all the time, I mm -hmm. think. But, yeah. It's, yeah. It, I think it's, I think, I think some organizations, some healthcare organizations will feel it more than others, um, and some will, it won't feel as, as difficult. I think it'll depend on where they are on their, their journey and trajectory, um, how well they've um, positioned the organization to withstand leadership changes. I know it's, um, um, I'm losing the word, uh, succession planning mm -hmm. and things like that um, come into play in a lot of this. but. It's, it's very important. Um, I think seeing a lot of organizations grow and, and you have new leaders, whether you're consolidating departments or organizations or, or because of the technology, you need that new, you know, uh, technically advanced person to run it. Um, it's, it's very difficult to keep momentum with what you have in place 
get people to stop doing what mm -hmm. they like to do, but now you don't need them to do, and also teach them the new things with right ten other objectives coming down the pipe. So, right. good. All right, third and final question for this panel, and then I think these folks are just about ready to respond. <laughs> or are we taking a ten minute intermission, Ed? Or no, I know I'm just kidding. Okay, so the uh, the final question. Rest. What's that? We need to rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the final question. Um, how, if at all, do you think practices, processes, or technologies from other industries will influence the healthcare supply chain? And we'll start with you this time, June. Sure. Yeah. So I think we've already started um, taking many of uh, you know the innovations from outside healthcare into the healthcare supply chain. So think about um, the sharing economy, right? So we have companies like Cohelo, Uber Freight, that looks at you know, additional capacity that could be shared within an organization. Um, so I think there could be many gains to be had um, thinking about, you know, thinking about that type of application. I do think that healthcare needs a bit more sharing of data. Um, you know, our industry, in particular, healthcare supply chain, um, is still in large part opaque. Uh, and because of that lack of transparency, um, vendor relationships, uh, traditional vendor to physician relationships, traditional selling, traditional negotiations are still king because there's no other source of data. Um, I think we've started to make inroads around data sharing, um, but I think if we really looked at um, how we can make the work that we do a bit more transparent, um, we can focus on arguably non, you know, we can. We can save the time that we would spend on arguably non-value added steps. You think about it, me negotiating a contract with a vendor doesn't make my patients feel better at all. Um, and so if we took that time that we would spend on that onto actual innovative time, thinking about how I increase new services to a patient's home, getting products to the patient pre prior to surgery, post-surgery to their patient's home for at-home care, um, I think that's where we need to go. Will, how about you? Um, I would say, I mean, it, uh, I think June is right on the button with uh, a lot of what he's saying. I, I, I thought of the same thing about Uber, Uber Freight. Uh, there's a lot of things, and we've been doing it for years. I mean, Toyota, right? You know, the auto industry has been uh, a, a feeding ground for uh, our industry to, to continue to grow. Have we grown in the same innovative pace, I think there, there's room there for growth, right? There's, there's for us to be the trendsetters versus maybe some of those other supply chain uh, industries. Um, I could tell you, you know, going back to data and analytics, uh, there is some um, uh, organization markets and markets.com that, that suggests that supply chain analy uh, analytics market is worth, will be worth $7.1 billion by 2023. I mean, that's going into what he's saying about you know, maybe there's opportunity here in data analytics, uh, sharing that an those analytics uh, and getting the most out of it and finding people who are talented enough to analyze the data that we, you know, with more and more data that we get every single day, do we have the folks that can easily translate that to yeah. us, you know? Um, so that's part of the, the, the things that I can see, yeah. So can I answer it a little bit different? Yeah, of um, course. I know a lot of the focus with the, um, the positive side, which I think is great in terms of what we can get from other industries. I, I, I think there is a maybe a, a caution as well. Um, there are a lot of things that in other industries work great, um, and it, it would potentially be a big mistake to try to, to leverage them in healthcare supply chain. And that doesn't, that's not something to paint with a broad uh, brush and say, this one's in, this one's out, this is possible, this isn't. But I think it's being able to understand your organization and its capabilities and what it's what the requirements will be to, to implement an idea or a process that's coming from another organization that may be much larger or where supply chain is a core competency, um, their budget is more or right their ability to attract certain um, uh, talent pools is different. Um, things don't always work the same when you plug and play. And I know we all know that, um, but, but I do think there's a little bit of caution um, I know there's a, a fancy phrase for it, but you know, just not to be starstruck or awestruck with something 
that looks cool, um, or just because one or two or five organizations got great successes out of it. We call it there. shiny things syndrome in Texas. Okay, I like that, shiny, <laughs> shiny things syndrome. So um, I think there needs to be a little bit of, a little bit of a caution um, of that. But to move it back to the positive side, I think one of the things that will be important um, is giving the leaders who can understand the technology and pull the right people in the room, um, you, you have to give them that time. They have to have think time. They have to have, um, you know, you have to have the ability to pull some of your folks off the floor that really know the processes or, or your, your folks that really understand some of the challenges and have those conversations. And that's going to be time away from all those other things we talked about, yeah. right? And, and I think that is one of the things that's very um, critical. It's often overlooked. I think that's why there have been a lot of challenges with large technology implementations, whether it's rushing to a deadline or assuming everybody else, you know, is is going to fill in the gaps or your consultants will or, or someone with five years experience because they're really sharp and we recruit them from a great school or someone that's been there for 25 years and they got you through three other technology changes before. It's, it's, it's really kind of seeing what the opportunity is for itself and then really figuring out what pieces will work and what won't and then being able to make changes or adapt to that. That's good. All right, well, Ed, I think I'll pass it over to you. How about a quick round of applause for the future family panels? A lot of good stuff. Why don't you uh, man the mic? Yep. And then, so this is the um, the in your seat intermission part. Um, and for those of you that joined uh, after we opened up, the idea here is that these young professionals and it. I've got some some things to share. It was it was really interesting. I expected to hear something different, um, but. Uh, but the idea here is that these guys are kind of talking about what would they require um, and kind of how do they see the future in our industry. And then lastly, influences from outside our industry um, on our supply chains, on our trade relationships, et cetera. But, um, but the idea here is to kind of pick their brains a little bit, have them help us from those three perspectives understand what it's going to take for us to build an entrepreneurial environment in our organizations, what are young people looking for as they look to grow a career in supply chain. Um, and, uh, and then I'm creating a little intermission here because our seasoned executives are going to take a couple minutes and kind of prepare a response to what they heard. I've got a couple observations I'd like to make, but I'd also welcome anybody in the audience uh, to make an observation or two about what you heard, and then we'll turn it over to the seasoned executive panel to, to offer their thoughts as well. But, you know, I was kind of shocked, right? So everybody, the stereotype, right? The stereotype is you guys love technology, it's all gonna be about all this new technology and we're gonna automate everything. I did hear a couple of comments about automation, but what I heard was a couple of very astute young professionals talking about the reality of the environment. Talking about, I need time to think, research. I need time to come up with new processes, to challenge the way we've always done things. But it's really about, I need time for myself to think, and then I need time for me to develop relationships, to put context to what it is, to the influence that I can have within the organization. And then on the periphery was, you know, a little bit, of, a little bit about blockchain and a little bit about uh, RPAs or things like that, but that's secondary. I expected to hear a little bit more about advanced analytics and all the cool things that AI can do, but I heard three professionals that are really grounded in our organization and the fact that it is a relationship business. And I need time to engage my mind in that change. So any reaction to that? Is that? Uh, yeah, so I think supply chain in itself, right, it's the second oldest industry. Oh, you guys can fill in the blank on what the first one was. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but it's, it's the second oldest industry. What supply chain is, uh, and I, I'm, I'm probably being a little um, uh, over analytical here, but what supply chain is and, and at its core, what contracting is, what sourcing is, what operations is, receiving, you know, moving things from point A to point B, is not really gonna change a lot. And we all know that there'll be a little bit of, of how it is done, those core functions, because of technology, um, you know, 
faster machines, automation, et cetera. But at its core, it's still a lot of it is the same thing. I think a lot of what health, in my opinion, a lot of what healthcare's struggle is in terms of what their supply chain is and what they want it to be or where it will be in 15 years um, is not a question of supply chain in and of itself because the functions aren't really going to change unless there's a huge disruptor to it. You're really talking about the relationship with supply chain. It's how people or organizations, be it a supplier, GPO, your clinicians, the C-suite, the finance folks, how are they engaging? And more importantly, and, and you made a comment about this, June, just how, how can they leverage it? There's so much, I think, from, from what I've seen um, in, in talking with organizations, interviewing organizations, um, a lot of them don't really know that much about supply chain other than the pieces that they see. And I know there's some, uh, you know, that, the iceberg um, analogy and whatnot, but I think that's one of the things that really has to um, evolve and mature is people are really understanding what supply chain is and how it can help them achieve what they want, right? And I think there's been a lot of, you, you brought up the point value analysis and you had some other terms, and I think some of those organizations are figuring that out, and you do have to kind of rebrand those to get people to kind of engage and get that renewed excitement around it. But, but the core of what supply chain is, I, I don't know is really going to change. That's interesting. Thank you. You guys, any other comments? Or? Was that good, interesting, or? <laughs> no, very. <laughs> you don't have to answer that. No, I like the open <laughs> comment. Um, anything from the audience? Anybody want to ask a question? John. Watch this old guy jump off the stage. Uh, John Strong, uh, Bellwether class of 2011. Um, I was interested in the entrepreneurship uh, comments that, that were made by the panel number one. And I just, you know, I, I'd like to make a point or two points and then maybe have the panel react to it. Um, I was mentored, uh, one of my mentors was a guy named George Caldwell who was uh, inducted into the Healthcare Hall of Fame last year by Modern Healthcare. And George believed two things. Number one, he was very much an entrepreneur and wanted all sorts of, I think at one time we had 90 for-profit or semi-for-profit companies within the healthcare system. But the second thing is he saw uh, supply chain as a strategic uh, partner within the operation of the healthcare system. And I think as we look out over uh, some of the leaders that are out there today, I'm seeing that supply chain gets pushed three or four levels down in the organization, maybe more, and it's not viewed strategically. And I'm hopeful that some of the younger folks who are coming into hospital administration will see it like George did as a strategic advantage uh, where you can not only save money, but you can grow the organization through the supply chain by doing some for-profit activities as well as servicing acquisitions, uh, clinics, a whole diversified set of uh, healthcare uh, programs that are out there today. And he was very much uh, ahead of his time. He was a man ahead of his time in doing some of these things we take for granted today. He was uh, attempting to try in the 1980s. And so I think the, the point here is, is that number one, um, strategic importance and how you gain that within a healthcare system as you grow your supply chain. And number two, how you, um, how you really operate that supply chain for the good of the whole healthcare system. And so I just like comments on that, whether you see it, uh, you're, do, you, do you believe your success is tied to those of leaders who see uh, strategic importance in the healthcare supply chain, uh, or uh, are you somehow trapped four levels below uh, and uh, just trying to save money? Thanks. You want to take a step? Uh, I can see that. I can see that being the reality in today's world and depending on the organization. Um, I think part of what goes into it is, is really, uh, is your supply chain uh, reactive and constantly serving as kind of like a, uh, um, a stopgap or a crisis manager for the organization. Um, we have to change that view uh, and become leaders and be proactive so that we can take that next step and, and show the value. Right. I mean, we, I think we bring a lot of value in supply chain, uh, but if, if certain leaders only see us as the, the, the you know, the guy to pick up the, you know, let's, let's give the, these folks a call because we're back ordered and I need products or 
the truck didn't show up and I, you know, we have cases coming and uh, if that's the only way that they see us, then, then we're failing. Uh, I think, you know, we have to find solutions, we have to be proactive in supply chain uh, in order to make that step. Uh, I think it depends on the organization, but I think that can be done. I think um, someone once told me, I think one of my early mentors um, said that um, the best supply chain is one that you never hear about uh, because it just hums, it just works, right? And I think that might be true to some extent, uh, but also untrue in another extent. Um, I think it's true because if you have a supply chain that just hums, that means you've built a highly reliable supply chain. It works you know, you don't have too much product and you don't have too little product, you never have products running out and you have, you know, an efficient process for vetting new items, contracts and managing those vendor relationships. I think the core competencies are met. Uh, but I think that's a good supply chain. If you're talking about a great supply chain, it needs to be heard from. It needs to be a strategic partner like Will's talking about with your quality leadership, with your physician leadership, with the strategic leadership of the organization how can supply chain partner with you to solve problems even outside the four walls of a hospital, talking about social determinants of healthcare and saying, okay, if a patient needs to be driven from their home to their appointment or the patient needs healthier foods, how can supply chain assist with that? And so I think that's where, that would, that would be what distinguishes a supply chain that's highly reliable to a true kind of asset and partner to the organization strategically. Yeah, I think I think it's really a question around relationship relationships, whether it's at the individual leadership level, the, the supply chain leader and clinical leader, as example. Um, you got to have some kind of a relationship, whether it's good or bad. The second step to me, I think, is, is building the, the trust, um, because if there's trust, then you're more than likely going to have conversations, be brought into conversations and asked to sit in meetings that maybe aren't traditional. Um, and then that will grow into um, being a part of the, the strategy. I, I think um, not everybody can easily incorporate the different supporting uh, areas into their strategy because they don't understand enough about how it works. Get back to, you know, again, some of the, some folks don't understand how their PARs get replenished. They just know who to call when stuff isn't there. Um, and, and while it'd be great if you could get them all together and educate them on the A to Z's of supply chain, it isn't going to happen. But I think building that relationship, um, showing up, being there, taking the heat, building that trust, really coming down to trust, um, you got to have a problem to solve to kind of show them that you're more than just fixing it or not doing your job, right? Um, as far as how to grow, the number one thing I think that, that is critical is do the basics. and and maintain the basics, right? And you're gonna have mishaps and missteps, um, but but have it within tolerable range of your customers, <laughs> right? Um, but once you have that, and, and you both kind of talked about it, you know, then, then it isn't just, oh, supply chain just has to fix or they're top of mind when things break. Um, you, they become, you know, a more permanent player. I think um, not to negate, someone said supply chain. Um, I agree that supply chain may be like this, its own service line and growing to be, you know, uh, maybe at some of the higher levels of the organizations and I think that's great. But I also think um, it'd be good to teach people that supply chain is really part of the foundation of the other areas, right? When you think of all the different things, just take contracting as example, right? Every clinical area, every support area has contracts. Right, revenue cycle, HR, finance, IT, decision support. And so the, the skill, the function, the value that supply chain has, uh, while it may have its own strategy in supporting larger initiatives and its own, you know, again, what its business unit does, but getting people to realize that a lot of what they do is part of the foundation of how those other areas achieve their strategy or their goals uh, might be a step in the right direction as well. Yeah, and I appreciate the fact that you guys, in different comments, all recognized the platform that supply chain presents to you as a professional mm -hmm. because there's literally no other department in a health in a provider sector at least in a provider organization there's no other department that touches every colleague and every patient every day you know IT might argue you use the systems everybody but does everybody right mm -hmm. supply chain literally the decisions that emanate and the work that supply chain does literally touches every colleague 
and every patient every day. So it creates a heck of a platform for somebody to, uh, to build those relationships and grow a career and get recognized. So with that, let me turn to you guys. Um, so we've had, we asked really three questions, right? So we asked, what would they be looking for in an organization, in an environment? What, um, what do they expect it to look like? So what do they look for? What do they expect supply chain to look like into the future? And then lastly, outside influences, talking and queued up primarily about other supply chain industries coming into ours. So Nick, you want to start with uh, kind of what you heard on the looking for? Sure. First of all, I'm, I'm uh, very, uh, very impressed with uh, your observations. I really appreciate some of the things that you've said around uh, both leadership and what you expect from an organization. Uh, it's important that uh, I guess we all understand that empowerment is, is so real in the next generation because that's their expectation that we should have a, a way of creating an environment, a culture that allows for that, both from a top-down and a bottom-up perspective. I would say that what I, what I heard, I enjoyed. What I didn't hear that I thought I would hear a little more was transformation requires boldness, leadership boldness, be bold. There are folks in this room that are handing you the baton. We got it as far as we could <laughs> for a lot of us, but it's your turn. And uh, I think that, you know, there was a lot said around what you expect, and I, and I, I appreciate that, and I, I enjoyed that. Uh, but I would say uh, go after it. Don't expect uh, a CEO to just hand it to you. You have to develop uh, the relationships that you need uh, both uh, with the CEO and that team. Um, and the other thing I think John pointed out earlier, I think that um, we're going to see the supply chain in the C-suite. And that's uh, an awesome responsibility that we all have when you're looking at the size of the budget that you are responsible for. So believe that. And I think there's two more things I would like, like to just observe here. One is there's a little talk about uh, clinical integration. I thought there would be a little more. Um, I do, I feel strongly from my perspective that I think many of the next generation of supply chain leadership is going to be physician. I think there are enough young physicians coming out today, going into their uh, MBA programs that will enter the supply chain. And I think all of us need to be prepared for that. Uh, obviously, they're going to need a lot of support uh, from, uh, from others, from the team. But I think that, that that's possible. The other piece of that, which I didn't hear a whole lot about, is what's happening in our, in our industry today around mergers and acquisitions. Many of these organizations you would have never thought would have come together have. There's a larger footprint in the marketplace requiring a lot more support and a lot more expertise. I don't think outsourcing is going to be a dirty word anymore. I think people are going to look to the experts to help them support large health systems like a Trinity or someone else and, and really uh, look at the expertise required to do that. You know, in, in my day, uh, growing up in this business, outsourcing was not a word you used. I think some of you who grew up in the same time would agree with that. But I think today that's all changed. So be, be prepared to, to have the, uh, the ability and the wherewithal to, to be, in, be, be focused on that as well. But I'm really impressed. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Nick. Mary? Um, first of all, I'm, we're talking to an audience that is very seasoned and also driven. So I, I would share my observations, but recognize that I'm certainly not giving advice to, to this room of people. But when I listened to all of you talk about what you want in an employer, in an organization, in a leader. It was things like autonomy, contribution, support, pride in the organization that you work for. And 
I don't know that there's a difference between a younger person and myself. Those are all things that I think driven professionals in our industry would ask for. So there might be different ways that we're looking to, to have that demonstrated, but I do think that generally speaking, um, when you're a leader in the organization, you want to be an entrepreneur, but you also want support. You want folks to identify landmines for you. And it's been my experience as I've moved through my career and I've talked about joining different organizations that there aren't questions you can ask um, and there aren't certain things you can look for. It's just one of those things, you know it when you see it. Um, and I've been lucky enough to have about six out of 10 or so leaders that uh, stood out as, as real supporters and real folks that encouraged entrepreneurship and most of them are in this room today. So I would just encourage you to keep those aspirations, but know that they're probably the same aspirations that your current leader or your future leader had as well. Thank you, Mary. Carl? I would echo what Nick and Mary have said, and I'm equally impressed with all three of you. I'm very articulate and very, I, I love your passion and where your desires are. I would tell you that the ball's in your court, um, Healthcare supply chain leadership over the next 15 years is going to change dramatically as there will be a seismic amount of people retiring. So the, the, what's out in front of you is unprecedented in our industry. Um, I loved your comment, Amy, about fit and, and feel. Uh, I think it's really important that you align yourself with an organization with common beliefs and core values of what you're driving for. Um, and I think that that's something that everybody's searching for, kind of to Mary's point, that you want that. But the reality is we're at 700 some or slightly over 600 some IDNs now. Each of them has a different flavor and each one isn't gonna be right for each of you. Um, June, I love the comment about a good healthcare supply chain versus a great healthcare supply chain. My comment there would be you get the opportunity to be a great healthcare supply chain by first being a good healthcare supply chain and you, you kind of earn that right. And I think that part of getting supply chain into the C-suite, and I'm coming to this a little bit from a supplier side because I've had never worked for a provider, but I've worked for distribution technology companies and, and suppliers. Um, the opportunity to get in the C-suite is partly led by people in front of you seeing that there's a need for that. And I think a lot of that change will come as people migrate out of the current C-suite role and middle management or middle executive level that value that today but haven't been able to get that pulled into the C-suite happens. So uh, that's just kind of how I'm viewing it but uh, very impressive with your thoughts and comments. Super. So um, do you guys have any response? I mean, is there anything that you heard that, uh, and it, it was all very mentoring-like, right? It's, it was, uh, um, you know, very supportive, obviously very flattering for these guys. Um, but I would ask, is there anything you'd want to respond to, anything that the seasoned executives shared that you guys would want to react to? I had a couple of thoughts, um, Nick, when you were speaking, just a little, a little hodgepodge. Um, I guess first on the, on the, the being bold, um, I guess I'll turn this back as a question to you, um, panel. Um, I don't know that we are any more or less bold than a lot of folks in the room, um, whether bellwether or not. And so um, besides doing that or being that, Right. If things are changing, like what do you think is going to be different that that our boldness will be better perceived <laughs> than than the years prior? And Nick, I, it's so that was. I did you hear that? I'm sorry. I know the mic is turned this way a little bit. Oh, um, so so the question was, um, Amy was asking Nick to your comment about being bold. So okay. what's what about this environment? and the, the future environment will enable us to be more receptive of a young professional's boldness? Well, I, I think you know, uh, the young people today come with a, a, a lot of credibility, especially when it comes to the hard work that they did around education. And I, I think that there is a, a, a great deal of respect for what they're going through you know, I think, uh, June, you, you mentioned earlier about 
some of the expectations and uh, some of the things that are, uh, you know, not, not, not happening today. But I think too that uh, being bold means that you have the opportunity to empower yourself to really work with the C-suite and those folks that are really uh, create the environment, create the culture, and you have a lot to say about it. And it's not just talk, it's something that you're passionate about and, and it comes from your heart as well as your head. How did that feel? Did he answer your question? Amy? Anybody else, June? Will? Okay, very good. How about the audience? Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Harden? Let me get my steps in. Um, Ed Harden, Freighted Health, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I hope that I, I don't have to wait 107 years like Claire Barton did to ever make it on the Bellwether League. <laughs> Just vying for your votes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that, Ed. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, you guys, uh, the, 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 the younger generation, I'll, I'll say, uh, and, and I'd really maybe ask the question as well of the, of the, uh, the older generation uh, up here, is um, this understanding of generations. Uh, I have uh, kind of personally taken it upon myself to do uh, as much teaching as I can, and I find myself uh, in places that I've moved to, uh, you know, the local university, and doing my best to either serve as an adjunct or a guest speaker or, or serve in an adjunct type of capacity. Um, I think I'm so far removed from those that are, um, you know, sub 40 at this point that the only way that I can possibly keep up is to, to walk in their shoes a bit. So I'm curious as, uh, you know, where have you all taken some active steps to not just learn yourself, learn for yourselves, your own edification, but also um, uh, learn about that next generation? Um, because I, th I think that's pretty vital, because frankly, I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone in here would say their organization is particularly good uh, at uh, uh, learning and training internally. Most of us have to go to the outside uh, to get it. Um, and even then, I think the quality of, of what's available out there is not terrific. Um, and, and perhaps the best source of, of, of self-development uh, and maybe learning about what that next generation is thinking is through our local universities. Anyone care to comment? Anyone? I mean, I would tell you. I would tell you in my experience, uh, I've I've been uh, privileged to be part of uh, some some great conversations regarding uh, generations, uh, and just as, as not too long ago with Arm, our local Arm chapter, and they they brought in a nurse that talked about generational differences. Uh, you know, everywhere from our baby boomers and how they get along with Gen Xs to millennials, and what are what are the next ones called Gen Y or you know. And things like that, right? So, and, and what makes us different? What makes us special? What, uh, what, what draws interest to this this generation or not? Um, just at Loyola, we're we're starting a a, a whole new uh, diversity and inclusion program uh, uh, council throughout that's being rolled out throughout Trinity, and uh, I'm part of that council, and I'm looking forward to be given the the opportunity to you know to communicate out to our organization and toot our horn about you know. The leverage that we have with our diversity, right? Uh, be it what it is, whether it's it's religious diversity, it's gender diversity, it's generational diversity, and uh, and, and leveraging the, those those special aspects of uh, of our communities and our in our organizations. Anybody else? I think there's plenty of um, probably research around leading a multi generational workforce. Um, and I think that's you know more and more being taught across multiple organizations, usually led by HR departments. Um, I think I like what Mary said in that there's probably plenty that define us broadly as people. We like to be heard and understood, and that's not marker for any particular generation. That's true for all. We just want to be heard, understood, and collaborate. Um, 
But I think there's some specific nuances as well from generation to generation um, that define um, a particular generation over others uh, that would be important to, to kind of keep in mind. Um, but I think as long as we are approaching our interactions with a level of open-mindedness, curiosity, and um, an intent to collaborate and break down barriers, like I think about, you know, how do I work with the chief of cardiology at the hospital I'm from who has years and decades of experience? It's through genuine curiosity, genuine, you know, listening to someone, being prepared. I almost have to just honestly feel like I have to be two times more prepared than anyone else just by virtue of the fact that I have a shorter career than anyone else. Um, and that's just table stakes for me. Um, that's just you know, how I know I need to operate at all times. Uh, maybe it'll change in the future, but I think in general, um, I think as humans, we like to make sure that we are being listened to, heard, understood, and then collaborate together to solve problems. And that's not you know, different from generation to generation. Carl? I'm just curious, how do you prepare? when you're getting twice as well prepared as everybody else, I'm yeah. curious as to what are your resources? How do you, you know, if you've got a meeting with the cardiologist, what are you doing to prep for that? I like to make sure I know what he wants to talk about. And then um, I research a lot or talk to, you know, as many resources as I can find within the organization, outside the organization. Um, if I don't know, I tell them I don't know. And As a follow on, yeah. if I could, I'm just curious, how much of that research is online versus... Going to the library? Yeah. I've never gone to them. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, you know, a lot of it's talking to people, um, picking up the phone. I think, I don't know, I, I could be wrong. Maybe it's our industry, maybe it's our generation, but I find in our generation, it's really easy to pick up the phone and just say, hey, I have a problem, I'm solving it. Geisinger, you know, post it on an online board or, um, you know, pick up your, your text a friend. Uh, there's at least two other chief supply chain officers that I'm constantly texting with um, that will readily give me answers if I need them, uh, if they've experienced that problem before. Um, I think, uh, you know, we are very much um, kind of social creatures, probably born by the fact that most of us grew up and the internet's already there, and the pr main purpose of the internet is information sharing. So I think that's probably d deeply embedded in our DNA. Amy, you had to bite your tongue. You started to say something. Yeah, I, I, I think I struggle with a lot of the conversations around generation um, conversations, the generational conversation, because um, I think it's another stereotype, another broad brush that is stifling the conversation and being able to really understand what's needed. So it's interesting to me that organizations look at individuals as a generation in trying to uh, preempt you know, what they want or don't want or how they're going to be. Um, I, I don't know that, I'll just speak for myself, I don't know that I as, as an employee have ever looked at my boss or a potential boss and said, oh, they're a Gen X or I don't know if I can work for them, right? Or, or looked at an organization in terms of how long they've been around and think about what kind of cultural differences they may have if they're a 200 year organization versus 10 years, a, you know, maybe startup versus not. But um, I just think it's kind of interesting and I think um, kind of tying a couple of things, just focusing on the individuals and, and having a dialogue and figuring out where the similarities are. And if there are differences, how does it impact? Because it may not impact some of the things that are going on. Um, from a, I know you didn't really ask, but from a research perspective, I, I approach research a little bit different um, in, in some of the meetings I have. My research is more around finding out who knows the person um, and kind of their style, their, their, what they expect, not so much knowledge and how the meeting will go, but more in terms of what they respond to. Are they more statistics or are they more uh, you know, personal conversation first? Do they want detail or do they just want the reassurance, right, a face to to blame if, if things don't work out. So maybe maybe a couple, a different dimension in, in some of that research um, to, your, to your question, Carl. Very interesting, good. Anybody else have, we've probably got time for one more. Anybody else have a question? Okay, well, I've got a lot out of this. This has been really interesting for me. I hope for you guys as well. Again, just trying to better understand how we create that entrepreneurial spirit within our organizations as our supply chain continues 
to be faced with more and more change and challenge, Carl, as you articulated. Um, so what, uh, what we're doing now is standing in the way of you all at the bar, the cocktails, right? So um, please, before we adjourn, though, I would very much appreciate you guys joining me and thanking the panelists for the discussion today. <laughs> So thank you all. The bar is probably set up out in the yeah. hallway there. So uh, please look forward to meeting you this evening. And uh, thank you for joining us.